Okay, in this video, we are going to be deriving the C48 character table. And so um, in order to do this, it's nice to have a molecule that we can look at that has C4H symmetry. Um, and then from there, we can pretty straightforwardly derive uh, what the different symmetry elements are for um, this point group. You don't need to have a molecule to visualize in order to do this um, if you are well-versed in your <clears throat> point group definitions, but if you're not, it can really help. So of course, you're always gonna have identity. Um, you're gonna have, as the point group name uh, implies, you're gonna have a C4, and that's going down the molecule, right? That is a 90 degree rotation. So that's your C4. And um, you can do this C4 two times, if you do the C4 two times, um, that is going to be equal to uh, a C2. I'm using this hat notation, which means that we're talking about operations. When I don't use a hat, um, this should have a hat. When I don't use a hat notation, we're talking about a class instead. Um, and we can also do uh, a C4 three times, which is a 270 degree rotation. Of course, we cannot do a C4 four times, or well, we can, but if we do that, that is the same thing as doing an identity, which we've already listed here. Um, and then the C4H uh, point group, is because it has H in it, it's telling us we have a horizontal mirror plane. This is gonna be in the plane of the molecule. So it's perpendicular to the principal rotation axis, um, the C4. So we have that uh, uh, sigma H. And uh, what, other, what other operations do we have? Well, we can start combining these two operations. Kind of fundamentally, in some ways, these are all that we have, um, but we can start combining these. So we can do, for example, um, a C4 followed by a sigma H. And that, you may remember, is called an improper rotation axis. Mathematically, it's actually a different sort of, of operation. Um, and so that we would call it an S4. And so, you know, you can see a sigma H is in the plane of the molecule, so it's not doing anything to these atoms. Um, it's just taking the top half of an atom and transforming it to the bottom half of an atom, but because atoms are spheres, that's all symmetrical. So the C4 is going to be doing a 90 degree rotation, right? Taking this atom, this nitrogen atom in this case, this is some copper, um, azide complex, taking this nitrogen atom and putting it into this nitrogen atom. Um, and then you follow it by sigma H, which doesn't really do anything, but it's gonna flip anything at the top of the molecule and put it to the bottom of the molecule. And that would be an S4. So that's a unique operation. We also could do um, a C4 twice, right? Which we said is a C2, 180 degree rotation. We could do that followed by sigma H and that turns out to be the definition of inversion. And remember, inversion is putting, um, or that is equivalent to inversion, I should say, which the definition is taking a point x, y, z, any arbitrary point, and taking it into negative x, negative y, negative z. This molecule has this. Um, and you can see that, you know, um, in words, what that means is something is going to go to its opposite. So something like this atom here, um, which is at the top, left, and behind molecule will go to the opposite, which is the front, right, and bottom of the molecule. So this is another point group, uh, another uh, operation that we have in this point group. And then we also have um, an S4, we can do a S4 three times, right? That is um, a C4 three times, 270 degree rotation followed by sigma H. That will get us an S4 three times. And that's actually it, okay? There's no other mirror planes. There's no vertical mirror planes um, chopping through this molecule this way because of sort of these interesting, maybe propeller-ish type shape of these uh, azides. That's what breaks that from, from having that symmetry there. Um, and then you have the question of, so all right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, different operations here. How do we organize these into classes? Um, and 
identity and inversion are always in a class by themselves. Sigma H, this is the only mirror plane. So that's pretty obviously going to be in a class by itself. And you know, S4 and S3, those are the two improper rotation axes. And C4, C2, and C4, 3 are, um, are rotation axes. So um, the C4, the C2 is you know, pretty distinct from the C4, right? The C2 is doing 180 degrees, it's taking here to here. And so these are definitely going to be in different classes. Um, when you're considering the C4, like in other point groups, when you do the CNV type point groups, for example, um, I have videos on you know, C2V, C3V, C4V, C5V, but like C4V point group, when we do that one, we actually group C4, 3 and C4 in the same class. And it's tempting to do that here. Um, and the reason why we might want to do that, and we do that in CNV, is because it looks like you know, doing a C4-3 this way is the same as doing a C4 that way. In the, um, uh, 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 sorry, is, is the same as, um, yeah, I said it right, but my drawing wasn't great. So C4-3 going all the way this way versus doing a C4 that way. So it looks like they're equivalent depending on how you define your axis systems, right? Which way you're rotating. The problem is or what ends up happening with these CNH or CM point groups is that there is no way to interconvert those axis systems. So the mathematical rigorous definition of whether or not you put things in the same class, two operations in the same class, is if they are equivalent with different Cartesian coordinate systems, but that and that those Cartesian coordinate systems, um, which they're equivalent in, can be interconverted with some symmetry operation in the group. And usually that symmetry operation is going to be a perpendicular C2 or sigma V or sigma D, and we don't have those in this group. And so basically what that ends up meaning is C4 and C4-3 are going to be in separate classes. Where we talked about why C2 is in a separate class. And for very similar reasons, S4 and S4-3 are in separate classes. So what that all boils down to is all of these um, operations, these eight operations, are all going to be in separate classes. And so now that we know that, we can write our skeleton of our point group of our character table. We write our point group on the top left here, and we're going to put our eight classes, which was identity. Now I'm dropping the hat notation. <clears throat> we have identity. We have um, our principal rotation axis C4. We have our C2. We have our C4 three times. We have our sigma h, um, we have our s4 three times, we have an inversion, um, and we also have an s4. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is going to be eight dimensional space that we're dealing with. So um, you know, it's abstract algebra, you can have eight dimensions here. And we're going to be putting down eight dimensional vectors or uh, irreducible representations, as we call them, in group theory. So one of the group theory rules states that the number of columns is equal to the number of rows in the character table. So we have eight columns or eight classes. So we're going to have to have eight um, irreducible representations. And to start out, we just give them generic names, gamma one, all the way through gamma eight. Um, and at this stage, what we want to do is put in our totally symmetric representation. We're going to start puzzling out this character table. And so every character table, the first irreducible representation is going to be totally symmetric, ones across the board. Um, and then what we can do is start testing different functions. I'm going to draw an axis system here to help us visualize something. Um, we have x, y, and z, and we have a principal rotation axis. It's always defined as wrapping around the z-axis. So um, our C4 uh, operations you know, C4, C4, 2, um, et cetera, um, are all going to be wrapping around the Z. Um, and what we're going to think about in this case to start out, our X and Y we can define in any way, by the way. Um, they just have to be perpendicular to one another and perpendicular to Z. But we're going to start thinking about a Z vector and ask, how does the Z vector transform in the different 
operations of each class. We only have to pick one operation this in each class. In this case, there only is one operation in each class, so we don't have a choice. Um, but, you know, identity always takes something to itself. So we get Z. And then we look for the matrix that describes, mathematically describes this transformation, which is a one by one matrix just containing the element one. And we take the character or chi, as we write with the Greek letter chi, chi of the identity operation is the trace or the character across this matrix, this wise public character table, which is sum across the diagonals. Well, there's no sum here. It's just the element because we have a one by one matrix. So the character here is one. So we can put down a one. And we're thinking this, we're doing this for the Z vector. So the Z function is gonna transform as uh, this gamma two that we're deriving. And so we go through this. Um, the next one is C4, right up here. And we have a Z vector, it's pointing up. And we're doing a rotation on this. Um, but when we rotate 90 degrees across the, the Z axis, this vector is still pointing up. And so we get the same thing where Z goes to Z and we have one by one matrix. And we're gonna take the trace of this matrix and just to sum across the diagonals. And so we get the character chi of C4 is one. And next one, just go right along C2. Z is also gonna go to Z. Again, we're just doing 180 degree rotation, but that it's along the Z, so that vector is still gonna go up. So I'm not gonna write out chi and all that stuff. Again, it's gonna be one because Z goes to Z. C4, three. Now we do a 270 degree rotation. And again, Z vector is still pointing up. So we get one. Sigma H, let's think about Sigma H. That's the next one. Um, this one Z actually goes to negative Z. And the reason why is if we have uh, a perpendicular mirror plane, which is gonna be in the X, Y plane, that vector is now lying above that plane, that Z vector. So it's gonna see itself in the mirror and be reflected into negative Z when you do that operation. So that's gonna get us Z negative one, is our one by one matrix. It's our character table, uh, our chi, our character of sigma H operation is gonna be negative one. So we're actually gonna put a negative one here. And then we can use the definition of the next one is S43, right? We know that equals C43 followed by a sigma H. And C43 did nothing, went to Z, and then a sigma H went to negative Z. So overall, that's gonna be a negative one. Inversion, by definition, um, takes x, y, any arbitrary point, x, y, z, to negative x, negative y, and negative z. So z obviously went to negative z in this definition. And so again, our character, um, our chi of the identity is gonna be equal to negative one. So we'll put a negative one up here. And our last one is S4. The S4 operation is S4, by the way, the order in which you place these is totally arbitrary. Um, so you, we could have switched these, we could have put inversion at the end, we could have put you know, C2 here, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, there are some standard ways that people usually do it with the character tables, but it's all arbitrary. Same thing with the ordering of these, right? Um, you don't have to have the totally symmetric one listed as the first vector, just arbitrary. But anyway, uh, S4 is a C4 followed by a sigma H. And so uh, C4 did nothing, it just took Z to Z, and sigma H took Z to minus C. So overall, we took Z to minus one, uh, minus Z, which gives us a minus one. And so using this function Z, we were able to derive um, a new irreducible representation, um, which we're still at this point just calling gamma two. But we got something different than the totally symmetric representation of ones across the board. And so uh, we're gonna keep, going through this sort of logic um, and test out different functions to uh, you know, keep, keep getting different uh, components of the uh, character table. And so let me just erase some things here. Oops, sorry about that, was a molecule. So um, after I test Z, that's usually the first one we like to test, um, I usually test X next and see what happens. 
So how does the x vector, we can now write an x vector, draw uh, an x vector here. How does that transform with each of these symmetry operations? Well, of course, x goes to x with identity. That's not very interesting. Let's do C4, that's the next one. Um, and x is what? It's gonna go to, to y. And if we have a y vector, so x went to y. So we have to describe how x transforms by invoking y. And vice versa for y, y is gonna go to negative x. Um, you can see that here, if I have a y vector, and I go negative, uh, uh, if I go 90 degrees to C4, we're gonna go to negative x. So this tells us that x and y transform together. And so I can write a two by two matrix that explains this transformation. And that's gonna be one, negative one, zero, zero. And that's, um, I'm sorry about that. That's not right. That would take x to negative x, uh, x to x and y to negative y. We want off diagonal components here. So zero is on the diagonal and it's gonna be one, negative one. And that would take x to y and uh, y to negative x. Now you take the trace of this matrix, sum across the diagonals, you get zero plus zero. So the chi of C4 is zero plus zero, which equals zero, okay? Well, since we figured out with the C4 that X and Y transform together, we also have to do that for um, identity. So X and Y are described by the identity matrix. X and Y go to X and Y. We take the trace across the, this matrix, the character of it, and we get chi of identity equals one plus one, which equals two. So at this point, we have a, a two here. We have a uh, zero for uh, C4, and we keep going on. So C2 is our next one. C2 is gonna go um, 180 degrees. So X is actually gonna spin through that dashed blue line and go to negative X. So X goes to negative X. Y does the same thing. It goes, spins around here and goes to negative Y. So now we have X, Y, and we have negative ones on the diagonal. We get negative X, negative Y. We take the character of the matrix, sum across the diagonals, and we get chi C2 equals negative one plus negative one, which equals negative two. Um, and then we can do a C4 three times. So our next one. X here is gonna spin all the way around to negative Y. And Y is actually gonna spin all the way around to X. So here we get um, off diagonal elements. Um, one, zero. And we take the trace of the matrix. We get that the character chi of C43 equals zero plus zero, which equals zero. So we can put a zero here, okay? What about sigma H? Well, sigma H, I'm gonna erase some of our notes here. Sigma H is a mirror plane um, in the XY plane. And so if you have a vector in that plane, it's in the plane, so it's not gonna do anything. So that's gonna be identity, just like identity. Sigma H, um, X goes to X, Y goes to Y. And so we have the identity matrix. So we take the trace of that and that's gonna be equal to two. Now we do S4, three. Again, I just like to uh, remind ourselves of the definition of this, C4, three followed by sigma H. Okay, well, um, what did that do? We start with X. X went to negative Y when we did the C4, three, and then Y went to Y. So if we had negative Y, we just go to negative Y. Um, basically, sigma H did nothing, right? So we just have to look at this point, Y going to X. 
So it's going to be the same uh, matrix as C43, which is zero. Inversion, by definition, x, y, z, or uh, arbitrary point x, comma, y, comma, z goes to negative x, negative y, negative z. So x goes to negative x, y goes to negative y, and we get negative ones along the diagonal. And that gets us negative one plus negative one is zero for the trait. Uh, sorry, negative one plus negative one is negative two. Okay. And uh, lastly, <clears throat> we have S4, which is a C4 followed by a sigma H. We know sigma H didn't really do anything. So we just have to look at the character for C4. That was zero. So it's going to be zero. Um, and at this point, I like to actually sometimes just check to make sure we're satisfying orthogonality principles. Um, for this character table, you could actually um, puzzle it out, uh, the remaining vectors using orthogonality principles. I've kind of shown how to do that with some of the other uh, character table derivation videos. For example, uh, I did it in the C2H um, character table derivation video entirely that way. Um, but you can already just kind of check your work and make sure that uh, everything is orthogonal. So what we can do is test, for example, um, you know, is gamma one dotted with gamma three orthogonal? And so orthogonality means that the dot product has to be equal to zero. And so um, in, in, in these character tables, it's the dot product that's also adjusted by multiplying one of the vectors by the total number of symmetry operations um, in each class. Now the total number of symmetry operations in each class in this case is just one. So um, you can just kind of check this mentally very easily because you have one symmetry operation in each class, um, and then you're basically good to go. So we can just check this two times one is two. Well, all this is one as well. So the basically it's going to end up the dot product is just summation, right? You multiply this by this. If we're doing dot one, gamma one dot gamma three. We're testing to see if this is true. It's just this times this plus 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 this times this. Plus this, times this. Okay, all times my ones up there as well, uh, because there's one symmetry operation in his class. And anyway, that ends up just being two plus zero plus negative two plus zero plus two plus zero plus negative two plus zero, which equals zero. So we know we're gonna be good. You can dot it with this one, you're gonna get a positive two, a negative two, a negative two, and a positive two, that's also gonna be equal to zero. So it's just nice to test that out. Now, um, let's just keep going here and uh, test some other functions. So we have z that is not um, equal to ones across the board. A lot of the character tables, z will transform as a totally symmetric, but because we have the sigma h here, it doesn't. Um, and so uh, we can use this function to then help us derive other functions, particularly if we do xz. And if we do xz, um, we know that the xz function, x times z, xz is gonna to have to transform as something because x and y transform together. It's gonna to have to transform together with yz, right? Because x and y transform together. And um, it's gonna be pretty easy to then derive this because we're gonna do, if we're gonna think about, you know, if we do the identity on xz, what's gonna happen is gonna to go to xz. On yz is gonna to go to yz. We know they transform together. And for C, uh, uh, sorry, for C4, you know, the same thing is gonna happen and Z owes went to Z. That's why we had a one here, okay? And so when we have ones for, for the gamma two under have Z, we know the next character is just gonna transform as gamma three until we get to sigma H, right? Because sigma H is Z transformed as a negative one. So we're gonna actually have a negative two there. So just to show you that, right, when we had a sigma h, remember x and y went to themselves, but z went to the negative itself. So xz is gonna go to negative xz, x went to x, and z went to negative z, gives you negative xz, and yz, same thing, y 
uh, with y, but z went to negative z. So you're going to get negative y, z. And then you're going to get a matrix that ends up looking like this, right? And then you take the trace of it, you get negative 2. That basically just came from 2 times negative 1 um, is a way of thinking about that. So uh, we're just going to get negative values for the rest of this part of the uh, uh, vector here for how x, z, and y, z transform. Well, negative 1 times 0 is 0. Negative 1 times negative 2 is 2. Negative 1 times 0 is 0. So that's another function. And again, we can check to make sure that this is um, orthogonal. And you know you could do it a couple of ways. You could check gamma 3, dotted with gamma 4. All the combinations of everything are orthogonal. 2 times 2 plus negative 2 times negative 2 is 8, plus 2 times negative 4 gets us back down to four, and then plus two times negative two gets us back down to zero. So it is orthogonal. I um, mean, you can check the other ones and those are gonna be orthogonal as well. So we know we're good. Um, and at this point, you know, we can just keep testing different functions. We can think about other combinations here. Why don't we test uh, x, y, x times y. That's another quadratic function. You know, we got your d orbitals, x, y, x, z, y, z, z squared and x squared minus y squared. Let's do x, y, that's a simple one, relatively speaking. Um, and so how do we do this? Well, we gotta uh, think about this a little bit, um, but first, you know, we can do identity. x, y, of course, is gonna go to x, y. C4, you remember for C4, x went to y, and y went to negative x. So what's gonna happen then? x times y is going to go to negative xy, right? And to keep going through this, c2, x went to negative x, spun around, y went to negative y. So xy is going to go to negative x times negative y, which is equal to xy. So, so far, it looks like we have a character of 1, a character of negative 1, uh, a character of 1. And then we can do uh, c4 three times. C4 three times, we have X going all the way to negative Y. And Y was spinning all the way to X. And so X times Y is gonna go to negative XY. So we're gonna get negative one. Um, and so I'm gonna start filling those in here. Um, just like this, one for identity, negative one, one, and negative one. And we have a sigma h. Sigma h, remember x and y both say the same. So x goes to x, y goes to y, and so xy is going to go to xy. And so we're going to get a 1. S43? Well, S43 was functionally just the same as a C43 because this S43, again, is equal to C43 times sigma H. Sigma H doesn't do anything as we just established. So we just look to the C4 uh, three character and we get a negative one. And very similar thing is gonna happen with S4. So we just look to the uh, C4 character, which was a negative one. And then we have inversion. Um, inversion, we know the definition is X goes to negative X y goes to negative y, and z goes to negative z. They all go to the opposite of one another. So x, y is going to go to negative x times negative y, which is just equal to x, y. So x, y went to x, y, so we get a character of y. Um, and again, you know, I encourage you while I erase this, we can look at, um, we, can, we can look at if these are orthogonal to one another, right? So this new gamma that we came up for the gamma for, for x, y, this new irreducible representation, we can think about whether or not that's orthogonal. So um, first test is, hey, look, we need to have four negative ones um, and four positive ones in order to be orthogonal with gamma one. So we're gonna be multiplying that by all ones across the board, and we see we do. And so this is how you can kind of puzzle this out um, using the orthogonality theorem if you, if you want to. Um, and so, but let's let's keep going and think about uh, other combinations that, uh, other functions that we could test. 
And so another one we could test is a cubic function. This would be how an f orbital transforms. Um, and so that function is uh, x, y, z. Okay. And so the function uh, x, y, z is <laughs> perhaps will give us something different because we're going to be doing x, y times in by z. And let's see. So we got one and one, one times negative one, one times one, one times negative one, negative one times one is negative one. So we generated something different here. We're generating something. Different. We get one, negative one times one, negative one, and negative one times negative one is one. And indeed, we have four negative ones still and four positive ones. So we know we're going to be orthogonal to m one, and we're actually good. And so at this point, we can assign the Mulliken symbols. We actually could test other functions. Um, they might be mathematically more complicated, but you're not going to find uh, any more unique vectors, unique irreducible representations. And so we can assign the Mulliken symbols. We know that um, the Mulliken symbol rules, I have a video on that, but if you have the dimensionality being one, that's the character under the identity class, you're going to give it an A or a B. And you're going to give it an A if you're symmetric with the principal rotation axis, which is C4. So we're going to give this one an A, this one an A, sorry. I should draw those a little more in line with their vectors. Um, this one a B, so one dimensionality, but a negative one under C4, the principal rotation axis, and this one a B as well. How do you distinguish between these? Um, well, uh, you're going to have to go to the uh, inversion operators is is the way that the convention says to do it now. And so um, if you have, the rule says, or the, the nomenclature for this, is if you have a positive value here, you use the subscript G, it stands for Gerada in German. Um, if So this is going to be AG, this would be BG because we have a positive. And then a U, if, um, or ungerada, if you're anti-symmetric with respect to inversion. So you have a negative one here and a negative one here. And then for these ones, we call them E because the dimensionality is two. Anytime you have um, dimensionality two, character two under the identity, you give it E. Now this E is the molten symbol E, not to be confused with the identity class E. And uh, here, similarly, if we have a negative sign for um, inversion, we give it a U, ungerata, and a positive sign, we give it a G. And so at this point, things are looking pretty good. There's just one major problem. And that major problem is that we're not following our um, all of our character table rules. One of the character table rules, right, that we said in the very beginning was that the number of rows has to equal the number of columns or the number of classes has to equal the number of irreducible representations is another way of saying it. And here we can see that uh, that's not true in this case, right? We have eight classes, but we only have six vectors, only six irreducible re representations. Um, and so we're violating that. Furthermore, the sum of the squares of the dimensionalities, one squared plus one squared plus two squared plus two squared plus one squared plus one squared, is supposed to equal eight, the total number of symmetry elements in each class. And that's not true. And so what this means is that we're going to have to break up this EU, these EU and EG irreducible representations. And the way that we're going to do that um, is by breaking them up into subcomponents um, where we have two subcomponents with the value one. And we're going to do that for EU and we're going to do that for EG. And um, what that's going to do is now we're no longer going to have these twos, but we're gonna have eight ones. And as you square one, eight, you know, eight different ones and add them, um, you're gonna get eight, which is the order point group. Furthermore, you'll also have eight vectors now, eight irreducible representations, which you're gonna have, you know, the same number of classes. So your character rules, table rules are gonna be satisfied. Um, the problem with this is that in order to have um, solutions here, you're going to have that they're going to have to transform as imaginary functions so they're complex functions that have real and imaginary parts or maybe just purely imaginary parts there's going to be imaginary function there's no real functions that transform um, with the symmetries of these vectors that we're going to derive and so we'll do that in 
part two of this derivation.